It's a pleasure to be here this evening for a number of reasons, which I will now enumerate, <laughs> <laughs> at least two of them. The first, as Megan mentioned, the Center for Fiction is the home of the Crime Fiction Academy. The CFA is proof of the center's dedication to all forms of fiction writing, and it's headed by the wonderful Jonathan Santlofer, a marvelous writer and visual artist, and a friend of a number of people here. The Academy treats the mystery genre with the respect it deserves, but doesn't always get. The second reason is the raison d'etre of tonight's gathering, Gordon McAlpine and his novel, Woman with a Blue Pencil. Gordon was kind enough to ask me to be a part of this evening, and it's a pleasure to be here to speak with him about his work. It's a truism that all writers start as readers. It's less frequently noted that professional writers become professional readers. We read out of a sense of duty to note prevailing trends, to oblige the friends who've written the books that pile up on the table. All sorts of reasons we read. It can be tough to maintain that hunger for fiction that occupied our ravenous youth. It's harder to be surprised, especially when it comes to genre fiction, where surprise or mystification is essential. This is why I'm happy that Gordon's books exist. Formerly challenging, cunningly crafted, deeply felt, always surprising, they please this reader enormously. Many critics choose to praise the mystery by saying that a work in question transcends the genre. This is well-meaning, if condescending, in my opinion, <laughs> and it misses the point. Works like Hammett Unwritten and Woman with a Blue Pencil don't transcend the genre. They fulfill it. They demonstrate what can be done with an eminently malleable and accessible popular form. Both novels feature an array of newly discovered documents, who, their author, who the authors are, why the documents were written, and how they came to light, a part of the larger mysteries of the books. Hammett Unwritten is about inspiration, or the lack thereof. In the, in the early 30s, Dashiell Hammett is approached by Moira O'Shea, the original Bridget O'Shaughnessy. She wants one thing from Hammett, a roughly carved stone bird, a souvenir of Hammett's last case. She tells the prolific, successful ex-detective that the statuette is responsible for his writing and the fame it's brought him. Now, Moira spent the last 11 years in a home for the criminally insane, so her credibility is open to question. <laughs> but to get rid of her, Hammett gives her the statuette, and then suffers a massive, monstrous inability to write. His desperate attempt to regain his creative life leads him to, well, I hope it's on sale here tonight. You can pick it up and see what he does. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon has described Woman with a Blue Pencil in an interview for the Big Thrill magazine. Gordon wrote, the book's structure consists of three alternating parts. First, the story of an LA-based Japanese-American detective who's been cut from a novel, yet who persists unrecognized on the very streets he thinks of as his home, unaware that he is a discarded fictional character. Second, letters from a commercial book editor to a young author that encourage him to make this cut, replacing his work in progress Japanese-American protagonist in response to world events, Pearl Harbor, and then turning what had been planned as a mystery novel into a spy thriller. Third, Excerpts from the published spy thriller featuring the politically expedient replacement character, his anti-Japanese racism sadly consistent with the times, who now squares off against Japanese-American fifth columnists infiltrating Los Angeles. It's a terrific book, equal parts page-turner and existential reflection, and, and into the bargain, entirely satisfying reading. As some of you know, and has been mentioned, Woman with a Blue Pencil was recently nominated for the Best Original Paperback Edgar Award. Join me in celebrating again that nomination and welcoming to the podium Gordon McAlpine. Um, I thought I'm only going to read for a, a, a little bit, um, and then we'll get to the discussion about the book. Um, I had had an idea for a long time, for a lot of years, about all of us are kind of in agreement, and it's often passed around the idea that characters have a life of their own. So it occurred to me, well, what happens to a character who's been cut from a book? What happens to a character who's been cut? Well, this idea I was discussing with my wife some years ago. 
Julie. And, um, but I, that was a, it was a concept. I didn't really have an idea yet. And some years later, I heard uh, a story about the Green Hornet. I don't know if any of you remember that old television or, ra or radio show before that. And in 1941, it was a weekly radio show, very successful. And the Green Hornet was the hero. And he had as his trusty aide his, his Japanese sidekick, Kato. And that's, I don't know what night it played on, say Thursday night. The Thursday night before Pearl Harbor, the show came on. It was the trusty Japanese sidekick, Kato. And the following Thursday night, it was his trusty Filipino sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, I thought, well, what, what must that have been like for a Japanese American kid turning on the radio? Suddenly, this uh, heroic character has been erased or altered, altered at least. And I, and and it was at that point that I realized, okay, this is, this is, uh, this can tie into this idea of characters who've been uh, cut characters have been cut. And so, so this, this novel, be, in a sense, begins with a, uh, a young 22-year-old Nisei author living in Los Angeles, dreams of being a writer. And he's quite good. And he sold his first novel to a New York publisher in uh, sometime in the fall of 41. They've given him a small advance. And uh, he's delighted. And then Pearl Harbor comes along, and his and everything changes. And so I'll just read the part of the book, uh, uh, one of the three sections of the book, one of the three, uh, the way it's structured, consists of letters. So this is the letter that, that he receives, dated December 10th, 1941, and uh, written by the woman with the blue pencil. Blue pencil, by the way, that refers to it's an editor's tool nowadays with computers. This excerpt, so this is an excerpt from a letter dated December 10, 1941. So, in light of last Sunday's tragic events at Pearl Harbor, we must return your book proposal and opening chapters. Despite my initial enthusiasm, its publication is now impossible. While this is doubtless disappointing, I feel you cannot be much surprised. The world has changed. Even Marquand's successful Mr. Moto series is bound to come to a screeching halt. Nonetheless, we believe you are a talented writer, and we encourage you to further develop your craft. Our accounting department will anticipate your immediate return of the $350 advance we sent with our most recent correspondence. Sincerely, Maxine Wakefield, <coughs> Associate Editor, Metropolitan Modern Mysteries, Incorporated. P.S. If you were to consider revising your work to avoid the obvious issues, which would include cutting and replacing not only your Japanese hero, Sumida, but also the Caucasian villain, I would be willing to take a second look. Of course, I understand that this amounts to your writing a different book. But since you've completed only three chapters to date, your investment of time and effort have been relatively small. And so re-envisioning may be a viable option for you, Mr. Sato. Well. Thinking aloud, perhaps you could still employ an Oriental as your protagonist, a Korean, or Chinese. I don't mean to offend by suggesting that Oriental races are in any way interchangeable, but <laughs> <laughs> frankly, what most fascinated me in your initial submission was the groundbreaking challenge of pulling off an oriental protagonist in a popular genre. <laughs> After all, as you likely already know, Earl de Bigger's Charlie Chan books do not actually feature Chan as the protagonist. And the same is true of Markman's Mr. Moto novels. These books remain Caucasian-centric, even if the crimes are ultimately, quote, solved by the secondary characters, Chan and Moto. So you may still have the opportunity to break new ground. Mm -hmm. Now, even if you were to change your protagonist's nationality, I believe current events dictate that your new Korean or Chinese hero be far more American slash apple pie than your discarded character. 
the breathing Nisei academic Sumida. <laughs> Actually, you might even position your new Oriental hero against Japanese fifth columnists. <laughs> yes, patriotism will sell in the coming period. A spy novel, just musing here, you understand. These are your decisions. I would never tell an author what to write, particularly a young and talented one just starting to make his way. <laughs> However, I want you to know that if you choose to write something along the lines I've outlined above, I'd be delighted to see it and just possibly we'd be able to work together after all. Whatever you decide, best of luck. And with that, um, he embarks on a revision, but never loses track of the character that he cut. So that's just a little taste. That's that's a little taste of it. Thank you very much. Your bio, Gordon, says that you were born in California. Where? Whereabouts? And um, do you do you find being a Californian that your work is particularly Californian? That's a great. That's a great question. Um, I was I was born in in Los Angeles County, Linwood. If anybody knows where that is, and raised in Anaheim which is in Orange County. Um, and uh, that, that figures somewhat prominently in, in this book, which is largely set in and around downtown Los Angeles. Uh, but when I was growing up, Orange County was a, um, probably, you know, a largely agricultural oranges. You know, it was oranges. It was called Orange mm -hmm. County for a reason. And um, a number, and so there were a lot of people who had worked on farms before my birth, and a lot of my best friends growing up were Japanese Americans. They were um, the third generation Japanese Americans. And so, in that sense, I felt very much um, at home with the idea of identifying with. The, the person, the characters who would have been like my friends, moms, and dads. Uh, I knew them. In fact, uh, the characters in the book are all carry the last names of my friends growing up, Samita and Sato and, and uh, others. And so I think that that I grew up right where that was happening, and families were shipped out of there. And one of the things that I was really surprised by was how quickly that had happened. You know, December. The, the, I, I knew it had happened, but I didn't realize that the attacks on December 7th, of course, and the, the presidential order that uh, led to this was taking place in, in February. So there, it was a very, very sudden uh, turn of event. So I think my growing up there certainly played a part in this book. Mm -hmm. um, and also the whole sense of Los Angeles, with the last book as well, with Hammett, and with Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, there's that, and that, that golden noir era. And while Hammett wrote largely about San Francisco, he was certainly a, a, a gadfly in Los Angeles during much of that period, too. And so uh, there, are one, there are places you can go. Downtown Los Angeles still looks, a, in some ways, some buildings look a lot like they did in this era. Uh, and there are places you can, you can still eat them. At, on Hollywood Boulevard at Musso and Frank's and, mm -hmm. uh, and get a real feel for the ghosts that are all around there. So I do think that that's, that certainly has informed this turn towards noir. Mm -hmm. Also, there's the element of when one thinks of California and autom automatically we think of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But Garden Grove is here, Anaheim. It's that kind of liminal fringe, the, the, the cities that are, that are, that are that comprise, I guess, a greater Los Angeles. Was Edmund Wilson who said, you know, Los Angeles is 20 different cities looking for a center or something, you know? Right. I, I, you know, identity and, and this, the center, those, those ideas, I think, have been shaken up in that city. Oh, right. No, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I mean, where, um, while, while so much of the action takes place here, in, in a lot of ways, the heart of the book is in some of the backstory and, and the fact that, that, that he recalls his youth in Orange County mm -hmm. before he'd been written out. 
So you had the idea for a number of years about the idea of a character who's been excised from a work of fiction. When did you, when did you come across the idea of using the, the shameful historical context of the, you know, the, um, the, the, of the, of the Nisei's experience and um, combining the two? Well, it, it was, the, the first step, uh, it, was a, it was actually, I mentioned the, the Green Hornet, and that seemed like an opening, mm -hmm. but that's talking, and that's speaking as a kind of a, that's, that's kind of writer talk, right? It's an opening. As far as the heart goes, yeah. I was also acutely aware of the fact that while, we're, while all of us are in agreement that what happened to the uh, Japanese American citizens is a travesty, um, I was aware that that things haven't. We're not out of the woods altogether, and world events at the time, you know, in the last few years, have suggested to me that this is not an ir ir uh, irrelevant topic today. And so uh, I think it was a combination of those things. I think if 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 I had felt that I was writing. A novel that was only that, that was only about an event that could have happened in the 40s, and that we never have to worry about that sort of thing again, rushing an entire people with one, you know, uh, color. Yeah. Then I probably wouldn't have been drawn to it in the same way, because I did feel that it had a. Uh, I could look back and see something interesting. I could look in the present and see something interesting. Well, it's you know, current times are not that different from 1941. We're still at war. And there's a whole there's a whole class of people um, being demonized, or right. classes of people, types of people being demonized. Right. Exactly. So, w the structure of this, the alternating structure, the trio, I guess, the trio of voices. It's it, it's is that how how did you how did that evolve? How did you find how did you decide on those particular voices? And how in God's name did you arrange them? Because it's a very clever, cunning thank you mix. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the the, I'll start with uh, yeah. I'll start with who I, I think of as kind of the main the main character whose name is Sam Sumida. He's the character who's been cut, and he 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 goes into a movie theater to watch the Maltese Falcon, which happened to have been the t one of the top movies in the country in December of '41. I was really, I was thrilled to find that out. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's in there, and then suddenly the film the, the film you know so I don't know if you remember the the film kind of came off. Suddenly the screen, it's like, you, you can see the spools for a minute, and, and now you hear it, and the screen goes white, and, and this happens. And so he's anticipating that the audience might groan, you know, or something like that, but suddenly it's back up and running, very quickly, very quickly, except that it's a different movie. It's a Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn movie. And he sits there for a little while and thinks he's put, that they put the and makes some comments aloud. This is the wrong movie, expecting uh, everybody to get upset and start yelling up at the projections, but nobody is. Mm. Nobody is. And uh, and what's and, and so he goes to see the manager and the manager says, "Yeah, what are you talking about? Maltese Falcon closed last month. It's January." And and at this point, then when he goes outside, some time has elapsed, and. He's now in a world that does not recognize him anymore. And so in terms of the, my approach to that section as far as writing it, it was uh, that, I, that I made that writing, that third person writing, as sharp and, con and in a sense contemporary and uh, serious as I could. You know, to me, that's, it was, often it was hard because it's very painful. Yeah. It's, that's where a lot of the pain is concerned, this pain of dislocation, pain of erasure. And so he's, but he doesn't, not, he doesn't understand either. So he's trying to figure this out. He goes to his house, someone else lives in it. First he goes to the parking lot where he left his car. Well, he gives him a ticket to pick it up. They go, this ticket's from last December. There's no such car here. Winds up getting home, someone else is living in his house. So in a sense, that writing is as uh, clear and and contemporary as I could make it. Then, of course, we've got the letters, some of which you heard, which come in between these sections. And then we, get, then we see the mystery novel, or the, the spy novel, that the young man wrote instead. And that's got a whole different voice. The voice is entirely different. And it's, 
this fast-paced, uh, uh, fast-paced spy novel, much lighter in, in tone, except that it's horribly racist, xenophobic, and, um, but it doesn't know it is. It doesn't know it is. I mean, the, the references in the letter to Orientals, you know, my, as I was reading it, I was feeling embarrassed to be reading it, but that, that's, this is the atmosphere in which it's taking place. And I had read, uh, just for research, I'd read a number of pulp novels from the period. And um, they're actually, I had to pull back a little bit because I thought people wouldn't believe it. I thought people would not believe it as far as just how uh, offensive and, and they, they were. They were, how the propaganda they were. You may remember some of those um, Popeye cartoons which are now banned. They're oh. not shown on television anymore. But they were you know, shown in movie theaters in their day, which feature the, the, you know, the, the man of spinach-inspired strength you know, uh, um, fighting probably the most horribly caricatured Japanese mm -hmm. um, soldiers you will ever find. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're wisely not shown anymore. Right, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. That's good. But given that, these, those parts of the book must have been the most fun to write, I would think. Well, it's a kind of admission because they're so they're they're so reprehensible in a way, and they were the most fun to write <laughs> because because, they're the, because they they revolve around this altered character Jimmy Park, who is a Korean from Glendale, which is out in the uh, San Fernando Valley, and uh, and Jimmy Park is this kind of super spy, super patriotic. I, you know, I'll do anything for the country, and and manages these amazing feats. You know, at a certain point, he's He's jumped by some college students and manages to fend them all off and climb up an alley, uh, climb up a building and make his escape. And um, and he's, he's 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 taken in by an organization <coughs> that is uh, that will that actually shortly will become the OSS, which became the CIA, but they, they weren't that quite yet historically. So he's brought in by this secret organization to help uncover uh, what amounts to a kind of a Japanese dragon lady who's the head of all this spy stuff. So as, as reprehensible as all of that was, I do have to admit that was just, uh, you know, the, the Sumita stuff was painful and personal, and then I would get to this, and it was a kind of a, a it went fast. That part, those parts went fast. And um, the pacing is different also. So in the Sumita section, the, the pace is, it's a more psychological section, so it goes slower. You get to the act, you get to the pulp thriller, and it's kind of pulpy and thrilling. <laughs> Indeed. Um, did, did you have any uh, um, structure you were following, or did you did the, uh, how to put it? Did you have to spend a lot of time arranging the pieces of the, the three of the three sections, or did the form as it were the idea and came entire? It, you know, it, it kind of came entire. There were, there were some instances where I, I would go back. And one of the great things about, just about these letters, and the letters continue, because, because he, he ends up, we never, get, we never hear from the author himself. We only can infer about him through her letters. And in, in that sense, he's also the main character, even though he never actually appears in the book. Um, but in, in terms of, of the... The structure, every once in a while, I would find an opportunity to go back and um, so and insert things. So at one point, there's a scene in, in the pulp novel, which he's being direct, you know, he's being guided through by this experienced editor. In the pulp novel, there's a scene where Jimmy and uh, his friend, who's an LAPD officer, uh, go to this diner and they have a discussion and, and it's... It, it, it's sort of a, a real moment of friendship between them. And up to that point, when, as I'd written it, there, there was no reference to Jimmy being married or having a girlfriend or anything like that. And so then, following that scene, then it, I wrote the letter and from her and thought, well, you know, it's not just Japanese Americans who were being persecuted to you. D does this seem hint slightly of a kind of homoerotic attraction between these two men? She would jump all over that. 
and says, you know, the scene's good, it's a good scene, but we don't want people getting the wrong idea. You know. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I have nothing against anybody, you know, I'm a I, I have but I, I have homosexual friends as well, but but we don't want to go there. And so perhaps you should give Jimmy a, a girlfriend. You know. And then as you're reading it, then you realize that early on in one of the early chapters, he did have a girlfriend. He did, and that that was, so that sometimes, sometimes things that you take for granted in, in an early chapter, you come to understand they're, they're really not insignificant pieces. They're also a source of pleasure. I mean, I'll, I'll name a small, without, without giving too much away, because the, uh, where the, the doublings and the mirrorings and the reflections from, from section to section, I think is such fun. Uh, when Maxine Wakefield is trying to get a pseudonym for Sato, and she and he, he wants Robert Barrett, and she says it's fine, but you know William Thorne, which is what he use, they wind up using, because it's got it's got it's got the uh, Thorne, really, it's got lots of vowels in it. People love names with vowels. <laughs> but the gentleman that he goes to see in the secret cave in the mountains is named Richard Barrett. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He uses it for that. Mm -hmm. He uses it for that. At, yeah. At a certain point, she says. Uh, something about it's a good it's a good enough name for a character, but not for us. Yeah, right. Name. And yeah, she was right about that. <laughs> this might be a good place to talk about Maxine Wakefield. Um, she's I, 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 she strikes me as a highly ambivalent figure. She's the voice of the market. She's a professional woman whose interest, it seems to me, in in Sato and his work, becomes more than professional. And. Uh, and she's suggesting in the, in the most, with the most convincing tones, the most reasonable tones, major changes in her work. How, how should we view her? How do you view her? That's a good, well, well she's the title character. Yeah. Because I do consider her, uh, you know, she's the catalyst for all of this. Um, so she's very important. And, and I view her as a, as a real, she's a femme fatale. She is the femme fatale, the real femme fatale in the novel, in that sense, in a kind of a classic noir sense. But, but she's also his muse. And despite that, that, that first letter that, that I read to you, um, which, which is, um, once things get a little more technical, despite that first letter, she actually offers him a lot of good advice about how to write a thriller. And so she, uh, you know, there were a couple of things that needed to work. One is, for example, the Jimmy Park section, the pulp spy novel, needed to be entertaining as a pulp spy novel, or else it would have slowed down the book. You don't want to get to a section of a book that you don't want to read. And just as she would not have been a believable character, she wouldn't have been able to seduce him if 80% of her suggestions weren't really good suggestions. How to, you want to be in the marketplace? Here's how it's done. You know, and, here, and here's how you, and also some of it is here's how you become a better writer. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so there's a real balance there between her situation as a, in his life as a kind of femme fatale and as a muse. He wanted to be a novelist in 1941, 42, in that period, and she made it happen. And uh, at the same time, when it's all over, he, he comes to understand what he's done and uh, is ashamed by it. So where does she fall? She's a little of both. She's a little bit of both. And in that sense, too, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a I, I use the word advisedly, but it's a commentary on, on uh, the marketplace, some commercialism in general. I'm not at all opposed to a good commercial novel, but at all. And but uh, compromise, compromise. She asks him to compromise, which has its strengths and its weaknesses. Strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, would you call what? Woman with a Blue Pencil, a mystery novel with literary overtones, or a literary novel with mysterious overtones? <laughs> <laughs> or is, or is, as Robert Criscoll used to say in you know, the, uh, 
uh, his record comp, you know, uh, uh, distinction not cost effective. <laughs> well, the distinction may not be cost effective, but it's an interesting question that, that, that you ask. And I, you know, it's funny, it's changed over the last few years. Uh, certainly, uh, some years ago, before I became better acquainted with the mystery genre, I probably would have said it's a literary novel with mysterious overtones. Right now, I, I unabashedly say it's a mystery novel with literary elements. Uh, I'm sort of proud of that. And certainly writing Hammond Unwritten helped me to get, helped me to see that, helped me to get to that place. And to recognize, uh, as you pointed out, that this, that, that genre is not a bad word. Genre is not a bad word. Nor is it a non-literary word. And so, uh, sure, I would describe it as a mystery with literary overtones. And uh, you know, she, uh, Borges wrote kinds of detective stories, that no, unlike anybody else had written. But so, what is it? What is it? Yeah. You know. But in, in both books, the act of writing, what is written, how it's written, who's writing, those are not your, those are not perhaps not typical genre, uh, mystery certainly in the mystery genre. Certainly not standard obsessions or or subjects. What what leads you to them? Why is the act of writing so fascinating? Well, one thing is I feel like it's it's, it's I know about it more than I do about most th about uh, most other professions, mm -hmm. and it and, and the reason for that is that I am and have always been just deeply fascinated by the process of storytelling, and I and what I find is that you know I used to talk to classes sometimes about first-person narration, for example. And that in, in every first-person story, because uh, you all know what an unreliable narrator is, you know, Poe and this is the unreliable narrator. But, but all first-person narrators are unreliable. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. You're all unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> you're all unreliable. You know, because when you're telling a story, you're, you're telling it with an agenda, whether you know it or not. And that's not to suggest that, that it's a sinister one or a dishonest one. The word agenda isn't in and of itself pejorative. But the process of telling a story is embedded with so many layers of story beneath it. And so that's why I think, that's why I think writing, which is, which is just storytelling, that writing, what interests me are the layers beneath it. And that's very much what this is about. This is about the layers beneath these, these objects. The, novel, the, the very beginning of the, the novel refers to a, a box being found in a house in Garden Grove, a teardown house in Garden Grove. And it contains three items. One of them is a, a sheaf of letters. One of them is a published um, spy novel from the 1940s. And one of them is a... Uh, Bloodstained, mud splattered GI or uh, novella written on on GI issue paper called the Revised, which is the story of Sam Samita. And so these three these are three documents, three collections of documents, and um, putting together what they mean, what is what the story really is. And so it's always that underneath. It's always what's underneath the story that fascinates me. If it's yeah, that fascinates me. There's also, I mean, there's also the the whole question of who is there and who isn't, in certainly in fictional terms. Sumida, who once existed, now wanders through a city and a, a country, a world that he no he he has no place in. He's not recognized. He's not known. Um, but there's a there's a larger absence in the book as well, and that I think has to do with Sato. Can you talk about that a little? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, Sato is the young writer who, um, for, to whom that letter that I read is addressed. And, and in, in some ways, he is the, in, in my mind, even though he doesn't actually appear in the book, he's the most real of the characters. And, and I can identify with him in, in lots of different ways. Uh, on, the, on the most <coughs> surface level, where I was a 22-year-old who really, really wanted to write a novel and publish a novel and and it's a good idea to listen to the advice you're getting from a New York editor 
you know. And so I identified with him at that level also. Um, the other thing that runs throughout the book is a kind of sadness about his character. I'm going to give away what happens. You do learn what happens to his character, though he doesn't appear in the book. But you do learn about him. And also Sunita being a displaced person, being an erased person. And part of, part of that comes from, I, I came to realize about halfway through, because my father had just passed away when I was writing, or just before, while I was writing this book. <coughs> and about halfway through, um, it occurred to me that there was an alternate title for this book, not as good, and one that I, um, but it, it could work. It's the wrong kind of man. Mm. And I like this title better. I'm not, but thematically, it's about the wrong kind of man, being the wrong kind of man. In this case, it's being a Japanese American on December 8, 1941. You are the wrong kind of man mm. and woman. Right. And, um, but some of, and Samita's sense of moving through the world and, and being lost and not being recognized by it, and that sense of loss and that sense of, of being overlooked. It occurred to me only halfway through it that a lot of that had to do with my dad, who was uh, a, a really good man who uh, had come from a family. His father was a fairly successful physician. And they, there were, that generation, there was a kind of a, there were certain values. and there. And so my father supported a family of four, did a wonderful job with us, but did not become a wealthy man. He didn't, he wasn't a big, he wasn't what he'd have described as a big shot executive. And, uh, and in that sense, none of us ever held it against him. But I think he carried around the idea that somehow he was the wrong kind of man. And so, so much of the, so the emotional weight of that infuses both Sato and Samita with that sense of, with that sensibility for entirely different reasons. They have it foisted upon them, you know. But so did my dad. And so does everybody. And then it occurred to me also that this is a, this is not just my dad, this is all of us in a sense, you know. And that uh, is there anybody who at some time or another hasn't felt like the wrong kind of person? And if, and if you can't think of a moment in your life, just recall junior high. <laughs> <laughs> right? Go back then. Yeah. And, you know, and so it's, it's... So, you know, I really love Sato. I really love... I came to love him, and I, I find him heroic, in a sense, for what he ends up doing, which we come to understand what he ends up doing with his, with his life and with his writing. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but uh, it's against a lot of doubt. He overcomes doubt, and Samita too. I think he's it's Samita as we've as I think we've we've talked about his um, experience in the book is the most painful. It's really tough to read, and because I think in a, in a sense we all fear, or we all know I think or sense that. Uh, an economic disaster can render us invisible. A brain incident can mm -hmm. take away the life we knew. Um, and so, it, I mean, it, it's, it's just, as I, as, I, as I think I said the other day, I've, I've read the book a number of times, but it, it actually gets harder. This is, a, a, this, is, this is a testament to your skill. It gets, it's so painful reading about Sumida's quest, but I like the fact that he actually, because he does, I think he makes the choice that we all do, which is, as, you know, as a, a certain Irishman once said, I can't go on, I'll go on. Yes. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's he right. decides to go on. He Ultimately, he says, there's, there's, if there's, some, there's one thing that you're meant to do, then you, you just do it. Mm. You do it. Yeah, and I think you're, very, you're right. I mean, we all, um, the book has this historical layer. It has a political layer. But it, all, it has this personal layer. We're all vulnerable. We're all vulnerable when we step off the curb on the street outside. Life can change. We can and invisibility and erasure and all of this is something that we we live with. In writing the book and seeing it out into the world, 
where it's, where it's rightfully garnered a great deal of attention. I wonder if anyone has spoken to you yet, or it must have been an issue to you, which is um, writing from an Asian American perspective, or incorporating that in a day and age in which, again, rightfully so, the question of who's, who speaks for whom and under what circumstances is uh, fraught, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. what, how did you deal with that, or what are your thoughts on, on that aspect? You know, first, th there's been less commentary on that than I thought them, that there might be. That I thought that there might be, and, and part of it I think has to do with the structure of, of the book, that there are, that there are layers of fictions, and so there's a kind of distance. So I'm not, it's not any kind of sort of straightforward first person account of what it was like to be there in '42 at Manzanar. It's not, it isn't that. And, and, but having said that, also, um, I think empathy is the key ingredient to writing any character, any character. And uh, can men write a woman character? Can women write a male character? Well, of course. Of course, it's done all the time. It's done well all the time. Or not all the time, it's done well often. <laughs> it's often done poorly, but it's, it, it can be done well. So. Um, and I think that, that it's this deep empathy, and, it's, and it is, a, a, truthfully, a kind of genuine sadness that I feel, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, that is in the book, that um, the Japanese-American readers that I've heard from uh, identify that as sincere. Yeah. It's real. It, that, that's real. And... Um, the situation is unusual enough. It's it, it it's layers of narrative, so there's a little bit of distancing there. But the, at the heart, the empathy is is real, and so I haven't had any. No one has objected. Hmm. Nobody has objected. Yeah. Perhaps just it just occurs to me that perhaps it's because you're not taking it upon yourself to speak for all Japanese American experience or all any you know. In other words, to, in other words, to recolonize someone else's experience. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is not a this is this is not a comprehensive novel of the of the period. It's very specific about some very specific characters. Speaking of sp specifics, there's not a great deal. I mean, if, if, when you read the book, and I hope you will, you'll I think it paints a very vivid picture of 1941 uh, Los Angeles, California. But the the typical signifiers for that, Glenn Miller, la la. la. You know, it doesn't have all that kind of hoop to doodle about it. But there are some really interesting period details where um, Sumita calls information and he dials 113. Right. Or when, he, when um, uh, 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 Jimmy Park goes into the, there, there's a, a movie theater uh, where the Maltese Falcon was first playing and he sees the poster for the Falcon, Maltese Falcon, scotch taped to the wall. And I thought, I said, aha. Mr. Mr. McAlpine is a great writer, but there wasn't scotch tape in 1941. Yeah. It, it had to be thumbtacks, right? Uh -huh. Of course, you know, we can learn anything in 30 seconds, whether it's right or not. <laughs> is there, but I will, in this case, I will trust Wikipedia. And it said that scotch tape was invented in 1930. <laughs> I'll tell you the one so that it, it was completely... Uh, a, a, a completely legitimate choice for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, you, you were going to say interrupt. Well, me. these little details make, you know, one thing I found, because I've written books set in Paris in the 20s and, and Chicago in the 30s, some previous novels, and Kentucky at the turn of the last century. I, but what, one of the things that I've found is, is that it's, it takes very few details, really, to communicate a larger sense. I mean, Hemingway talked about the, the, his iceberg theory, right? That you've got all this weight underneath it, and you're only going to show the tip. You're only going to show the tip. And, um, and so, so these kinds of details, uh, it's surprising. If you, if you go back and look even at a tip at a, a movable piece, which is such an amazing mem it's an, a memoir of Paris in the 20s, and you look at it, and look at and you feel, and you put it down, and you go, God, I felt like I was there. And then if you really go back and look at it, how many details is he giving you? There aren't that many. Mm -hmm. there, there's the horse chestnut trees. There's the names of streets. You know? And so I, I learned a lot from that. Um, 
geography matters a lot. And the other, however, I'll tell you the one place where I almost got, I almost yeah. tripped myself up was, was there's a scene where uh, Samitas goes back to his house where he used to live. And there's been a crime committed there now. And the police are there. And there's an ambulance in the front yard and they're pulling out a, bo uh, a body. And, um, and so I was ready to write, you know, it was all sealed off with police tape. <laughs> and then, oh, of course not, no police tape. So I had to, that's one that I, I had to, and I had to look up. The internet makes some things very easy, you know. So there was no police, so then I found out when police tape was invented, the problem was, and I had to figure out, well, what would they do instead? And it took me a while to realize, to, re to recall old movies, and they were wooden police barriers in those days. Remember, when we think back to the old movies, the wooden, so, so these wooden police barriers. So I was careful. I was as careful as I could be. I, it's, I'm not ruling out the possibility that somebody will step forward and say. Sure. There's an example, in my first novel, which is set in 1932 at the World Series in Chicago, and Babe Ruth is at bat, and he gets up to bat, and the crowd is raucously cheering against him, and they're shouting down insults, so much so that even he is surprised, and is wondering what the hell is going on. I mean, and the, the, the loathing is so intense. And, and it occurs to him that maybe he left his fly open and he glances down there. I know, that's not it. And then the novel proceeds. Well, somebody wrote to me and said, baseball, baseball trousers did not have flies. You would have buttons, right? Yes. Buttons. So, okay, you don't get, you know what, I, I, I bring this up, I bring this up to say, you know, you don't always get it right, but I, but, but I, I, I try. Yeah. I tried. You know, one of my, just slightly, this is on the subject, but especially germane, but I'll mention it anyway. One of my favorite Los Angeles period details, I think, is the opening of Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. where the, the old fashioned traffic light, which has the actual, actually, oh, the yeah. actual hands or whatever, you know, uh, stop, go, mm -hmm. come into place, and you realize you're on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it's, great. That's the tiniest detail. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it is. It's the it, it is the tiny details. It really is. The, 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 the lobby of the hotel. Mm -hmm. You know, getting things right, getting the the elevator, much like this elevator. Here. As a playwright, uh, I think a, a, a serious playwright, which I go back then, I am, um, has to deal with a couple of mountains uh, in the theatrical landscape. One of them is uh, Beckett, whom we mentioned before this evening, and Harold Pinter. I mean, those are the those are the those are the writers that a playwright has to come to terms with them in some fashion. Imitate, learn from, reject, return to. I call them the inescapables. Who would be your inescapables? In, in this instance, it's a great question, thank you. And, uh, in this instance, the first would be, and I'm not just, I'm not just cribbing this from Joyce Carol Oates, but uh, the first would be Borges. Mm -hmm. Because he was always writing about stories also. Stories about stories. And all and manuscripts and found manuscripts and and layers upon and layers upon layers upon layers and in this instance Borges and Hammett. I mean, it meant a lot to me in that particular blurb that I, I was delighted to be listed. You know that she saw these literary figures in this work in one way or another. But but none of it would have worked if Hammett. If, if it was going to fa fall, uh, fail to pass the Hammett test, uh, you know, also. I mean, it's a mystery novel, and so um, it needs to pass the Hammett test. So I think in my mind, if I was going to do this Borgesian thing with story and narrative and layers, fine, but it better be a good mystery novel, and it better pass the Hammett test. So those are, those are the... Borges and Hammett. My two, yeah. in, in, I think, oh, are we at... Okay, one final question for you, Gordon, before we open up the floor. Okay. And that is, can you elaborate a bit upon why the Beatles complicate the issue of time travel? <laughs> uh, <laughs> why the Beatles complicate the issue of time travel? All right. We had this discussion. This. <laughs> well, one of the reasons that this book uh, and the setting, I think, works as well as it does, to whatever degree that is, yeah. 
is that I have a I have an affinity for this period, as and uh, and sometimes feel like I'm born out of time a little bit. Forties. Ah, oh, there's a period. <laughs> Except it was pre-Beatles, and this is a problem because. Um, I, I thought about this, you know, and I, and I thought about it in, in regards to my father also. You know, this was a, he came of age of a generation before the Beatles. And so uh, my generation and the, and the ones after us take for granted the idea that um, there are a lot of different ways of, of looking at the world. And all, you know, all you need is love is not a joke, exactly. And the weight of, that, of their cultural impact was sufficient that it can be a great reassurance. And that we all take it for granted now. We all take it for granted. Growing up, growing up with, in a world where there was a John Lennon freed us up from, from a certain kind of self-judgment. And I'm not, you know, maybe it wasn't all good, but it freed us up from a kind of self-judgment. And I, I was too young for the, I was 10 when they broke up, and so I was too young to really be, and, but they informed and freed me. And, it's, and so when I think back to my father's generation, which has to do with this book, and I think, well, maybe I don't want to go back to the 40s, because I, it, that's the hardest part, is getting into somebody's head who didn't grow up with certain things that we took for granted mm -hmm. culturally and, and philosophically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question. You're very welcome. I didn't see, I didn't expect to be this question. <laughs> <laughs> questions, so, yeah. questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, first of all, I love the book. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed reading it. Very, very complex and very satisfying. Uh, my question is, did you have your own personal woman with a blue pencil? Is that in any way or in my Did Did I? Um, no. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I wrote a little essay for the Center for Fiction here about the M my, my experience in an MFA program. And, and that, I think, can be treacherous. It's an all, as a kind of flip side of that. There's a, potentially... It's a kind of flip side. And I, I have great appreciation for my uh, mentors. However, having, and I taught for years in an MFA program too, I, I'm not, however, I, I am aware that, that there is a flip side and I, and I could see it and I came close to it where it's just the opposite. It's why would you want to write that? It's so commercial, you know, it's so, it's so, uh, you're just telling a story in a straightforward way. For, I'll give you an example. When I was in the MFA program, I, I, the Latin American writers, this was, you know, were massively uh, important, and they still are, but, but they were incredibly important and very influential to me. And I remember Graham Greene coming up at that point when I was a, when I was a 22 year old, you know, I had it all down. I wasn't going to read Graham Greene because. He just tells a story from beginning to end, and there's no magical realism, there's no fantasy element, there's no twist in time, he's not in a Bocock. Why would I read Graham Greene? And then, at, and then I was probably 40 by the time I came to Graham Greene, and said, oh my god, this guy's so good. Why hadn't I gotten to him? So in that sense, my experience was perhaps the opposite, was perhaps the opposite. Academic, you know, write, a, you know, write something that is, uh, that the academy would be able to teach and appreciate. So I was, I, and in a way, there's a lot of MFA programs now, and there aren't many editors out there who have the time, unfortunately, to take the care that this one does with this person. So in that sense, I think that's the place for young writers to be careful these days. Next question. I have to digress. Amen. Yes. Why were they booing a group? Oh, this is well. It, well, it was a, he was a Yankee, and it was it was against the Cubs. So, so the no, that novel starts in Wrigley Field. So they were booing him because he was the, the opponent. Uh, and Chicago fans are Rockets fans, you know, Cubs fans. 
in the World Series. That how's that for a fantasy? But <laughs> that, that actually happened. That did happen. In that time. Yes. I have two questions, um, but, but I don't want to ruin part of the book. So one question is: Maxine is um, she lies to him about an experience in her life? that you find out later didn't happen. And I also noticed that the relationship changes in how she signs her letters to him from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. Right. So, so why is she leaving? Why is she lying to him? Well, <laughs> in, in, she is a... Here, here's, here's the... When you are both muse and femme fatale, right? then I think in order to sustain those roles, although she would only see herself as amused, but, he, but maybe even just, maybe let's just take it from her perspective. In her mind, if she's gonna be this young man's guiding muse, then uh, there are no rules. Anything I can do to help this young person. And if, it, and if part of what will gain his trust is to tell him something that's not true about my personal life, to seem to be sharing something, and then, or, or to begin signing letters differently, starting with sincerely and ending with affectionately. If, if that's... Sometimes with nothing. Or with nothing, yeah. Yeah, sometimes with nothing. If, that, if that's what it takes in order to gain his trust, in the long run, I'm helping him. And, and so it is a manipulation, but it's one that she justifies to her son. And every good femme fatale is manipulative, right? <laughs> and every good muse is mani manipulative as well. Pat, you have a question? And yeah, I haven't yet read the book. I'm looking forward to it. But now this kind of begs the question. What's the age difference between Maxine and... Oh, and Sato? And Sato. Yeah. yeah, because in my head, I'm thinking she's like 50. Yeah, no, I, I think she's middle-aged. I can't yeah, remember. She, in the book, I, I, there's a little afterward in which I, I think she retires some 30 <laughs> years later, something like that. You know, so, so we have a sense. I, I, I picture her around 40. I picture her around 40. And the other thing, too, is she's an outsider as well. And, and I'm very much aware. I did, I did also research this because for, for a, I had this terrible thought one day. Oh, my God, what if there were no female <laughs> editors working in the mystery field? And, how do, how do you, and that one, you can't just Wikipedia that. And so I, I uh, got in touch with one of my editors who's got a lot of Facebook friends and who are editors and got that out and I found <coughs> the names of a couple. Mm -hmm. There were only a couple. Mm -hmm. And so she was very much, a, she, while things have changed now, she was very much a woman working in a man's world. Mm -hmm. And so her drive for a successful novel also comes from a position of being an outsider mm -hmm. as well. And so, um, so that that allowed me. I mean, she's a full character to me. She's a full character, and she's a she's a, a woman of her time, for better and worse, including that that, and um, she's she's real to me, you know. Does that question down here? I do have time for one more before we get back to the Okay. Yes, sir. Hey. Um, I too have not read the book, so uh, I'm okay. truly looking forward to well, it. Uh, and I too am a baby boomer, so I did not grow up in the 1940s. I know what I know about the 1940s. I know through my parents, who were you know very much alive and well during that time. But one thing I've learned is that, or I have learned, is that there was a tremendous amount of casual racism that went on amongst even people who were who should have known better mm -hmm. and, and probably did know better. You know when when you know our culture hopefully progressed to the point where that was no longer an acceptable thing. How, how do you deal with that in terms of again? You know, the, I, I gathered from everything I've heard today that you know the sympathy you have for for the you know the Japanese characters and the other Asian characters, but the fact was that that the country just was casually racist about many many things in the 1940s. And how do, how do you know how do you deal with that as a writer? Um, Acknowledging that, and at the same time, you know, criticizing. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a great question. 
you know, and also the, the, the country had been casually racist before the 40s, too, mm -hmm. right? And, and also, in, in regards to the Japanese Americans, there, there, there was an Asian Immigration Act passed, I think, in 1921 or something. The Chinese Exclusion Act. The Chinese, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that excluded immigrants from a particular group. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> but um, uh, you know what? I, I felt like I needed, here's what I felt like. I felt the most important thing for me was to believe myself that I had found these three, I found that metal box with the letters, the published novel, and the novella in it. I found those. And my job was only to arrange them in a way that, that, that fully expressed the full narrative, that what these three really mean together. And so that was my sort of guiding light. And, and, if, and if she, you know, if, if there's racism in, in the letters, if there's, ultimately if there's racism in the published book about it, that's what I found. And that's central, and really, that is central to to the novel. It's central to the novel. That kind of hatred is, is uh, part of what fuels the story. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's clear that it's not, they're certainly never endorsed. But I have to be real, you know, and I have to be true to what's in that box. And, that, and, and, and the idea that I had found, the, staying true to the idea of myself that I found this box was a kind of a guiding principle, which, which really helped to keep things for me to move from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And I wrote it in order. Some people have asked, did you write you know, the entire novella and then the, sp the spine off? But I, I, they all played off of one another. So thank you. I guess that's it. We're done. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.